I gladly accept the emblem of this office and with it, its responsibilities. I do now solemnly express to you and to the other members of the Board of Trustees and to all members of the Grinnell community my resolve to serve the college faithfully and to the best of my abilities. It is such a joy to be in your fine, glorious company, to hold up dear family, cherished friends, beloved mentors, new partners, honored guests, and the esteemed faculty, staff, students, and alumni of the Grinnell College community in this time we have together. Thank you so very much for the powerful words that have been spoken this morning. Taking a cue from our new banners, I can affirm that presidents don't inaugurate themselves. <laughs> Grinnellians do. <laughs> it's very true. And so yes, here we are, assembled for an inauguration, an event that gathers us to look to our future together. We do so within a shared past, all of us, most immediately a shared pandemic past that does not usually frame an inauguration. Two years of decisions and incertitude, of striving and stopping, of so much love and so much loss. One could justifiably ask, what could an inauguration mean after so long? Whence any sense of a new beginning? But these past two years give us occasion to ask, what does it mean to look to the future within a shared past? I ask you that question because I would argue that it is never too late to inaugurate, especially within a shared past. It is never too late for a community to look to its future and affirm what it believes in. It is never too late for a person or even a country to begin again. Indeed, beginning again is one of the deep-seated practices of this college, one of the rhythms of knowledge. Think of the first word of the poem, the first brushstroke on the canvas, the first data point on the graph, the first step onto the stage, the first formation of the hypothesis, the first survey of the field. Again, for the fifth time, the 50th time, the 500th time, or today, for this college, this community, this us, the 14th time. What will we bring into our future this time? I have three commitments to share with you in response to that question. These are three hopes girded by resolve, three deeply held beliefs, three wellsprings for what we can do together. My words will be intermingled with those of thinkers who have long shaped my thoughts and action and now deepen my ability to speak to my abiding love for and pledged stewardship of this marvel of a college, this Grinnell and all Grinnellians. So, let's begin with this word, inauguration. It calls us into our own future from a distant past. In ancient Rome, the augur was the religious official who read signs from the world here and now to predict the future yet to come. Of the many signs availing themselves to interpretation, the flights of birds were favored for foretelling the future. Perhaps it was the act of looking up at birds, the possibility of patterns, or the freedom of flight that made the Roman augur look up and wonder and makes us marvel still. The wild geese that fly through the poem by Mary Oliver, read by Iris, inaugurate a world that is, in the poet's words, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. The geese signal over and over again as they call out over the prairie and over us that whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination. And so my first commitment, a first resolute hope, 
that the future of a shared past calls on us to both see and safeguard imagination, to recognize it and nurture it within ourselves and others, to install those structures and places and times and policies and habits that foster imagination, that let us see what is possible in our work, in our ability to trust and to create trust, so as to build enduring foundations and vibrant knowledge for the more just and equitable society to which Grinnell College hearkens. This safeguarding of imagination is no small charge. In the beautiful performance of Joel Thompson's powerful composition, Hold Fast to Dreams, shared with us by the Grinnell Singers, you heard intermingled lines from two poems by Langston Hughes that set the stakes high for dreams and imagination. Asking what happens to a dream deferred in the poem Harlem pushes us as constituents and caretakers both of this college, this community, and this society to address the exclusion, discrimination, racism, and bigotry that defer dreams, that prevent imagination from taking full flight to joy and realization. Again, this safeguarding of imagination is no small charge. For if dreams die, Hughes writes in the poem, dreams, life is a broken winged bird. But this charge is one that we must take up. It is one that I promise you to which I will give my whole heart and effort so that Grinnell College offers itself to imagination so that ideas and joy take flight. When Roman read riddles from the 10th century, he engaged us in the play and work of imagination. Of the 91 riddles in the old English Exeter manuscript from which he read in translation, not a one is provided an answer. So the meaning of the riddles have thus been arrived at through centuries of imagining, debating, and mostly agreeing. Riddle 64, for example, in its stretch beyond the bounds of Middle Earth and shrinking down smaller than a handworm, has generally been agreed to signify nature or creation. But the past, too, I would posit, very much form fills all Earth and ancient worlds and cradles oceans, lakes, paths, and green plains in its arms. In this imagining of the riddle, the past is multiple and diverse. It is immense and specific, far-ranging to the future and close to home in the present, both impossible to fully comprehend and not to be forgotten. And so a second commitment, a second belief, that the future of a shared past calls on us to acknowledge that a shared past is not the same past that in the complexity and intersectionality of experiences and identities, events are chronicled one way and remembered another, that the same event can be experienced in distinctly different ways, that pasts are multiple. This acknowledgement is important on multiple scales. It is important in the breadth of the United States, whose contradictory foundation in principles of democracy and practices of slavery must be studied not in isolation or even in sequence, but rather within the complexity and context of black intellectual traditions and social movements, of multi-ethnic and multicultural migrations and immigrations and the perpetual reconfigurations of this country. This acknowledgement is important in the specificity of Grinnell College whose foundation in 1846 on the ancestral land of the Sioux and Iowa nations, following encroachment by white settlers and government land concessions in 1845, also intersects with the purchase of land by the Meskwaki Nation in nearby Tama, following migration from their Algonquin origins and the displacement of the Fox Wars. And so we must make room, we must hold space in our curriculum, in our programming, in our networks, in our communication, in our narratives, in our own telling of the past and future of the college for the very differing experiences, memories, languages, and identities that have enlivened this institution, that have given it meaning and purpose and direction. And herein lies the answer to the second riddle that Roman read 
the voiceless creatures speaking charmed words, the teacher of people who will live as long as folk walk the land, has been agreed to be a book, a gathering of knowledge. The last image the poet gives us is of having seen it open where people sit drinking together. And it's the openness of the book, the open-endedness of it is what I prize here. For it underscores that the understanding required for a differentiated past is never done, that the books we write, the knowledge we bring forth, will be rewritten or deepened by us or by others. And I pledge to you to be humble to that realization and to see hope in that humility. To that hope, I cannot help but return briefly to what is for me a foundational allegory, the Tower of Babel which I have long prized for its open-ended and unfinished quality, for its enduring state of perpetual becoming that I see as so akin to that of a college and a democracy, always in formation. In her own parable of the Tower of Babel, which she shared in her 1993 Nobel Prize address, Toni Morrison created a new interpretation for the long accepted failure of the tower's construction due to multiplicities of languages suddenly descending upon human beings. She saw instead in that unfinished architecture an opportunity and a hope in striving to understand different languages and experiences and pasts. Had they taken the time to understand one another, she writes, the heaven they imagined might have been found at their feet. Complicated, demanding, yes, but a view of heaven as life, not heaven as post-life. Now, if Toni Morrison opens up the possibility of a heaven in unfinished architecture, Gaston Bachelard invites us to think of the haven of dwelling places. Taking the poetics of space as his philosophical inquiry, Bachelard plums the allegorical, emotional, psychological, and sociological depths of the house and all its components, from cellar to attic and everything in between. The house as, sh excuse me, the house as shelter, the house as memory, as knowledge, as self, as society, and I would add, the house as college. In the early pages of the book from which Oliver read, Bachelard posits that the house shelters daydreaming, the house protects the dreamer, the house allows one to dream in peace. And Bachelard seeks a deeper meaning of the house as a dwelling place, as a place where daydreaming and imagination and memory are all intertwined and perpetual. He continues, it is because our memories of former dwelling places are relived as daydreams that these dwelling places of the past remain in us for all time. Placing Bachelard's complex layering of place and time within the framework of our college prompts me to see that we carry the future of Grinnell in our shared experiences of it. And so to my third commitment to you today, to that wellspring for what we can build together, that the future of a shared past calls on us to steward our dwelling places. The knowledge we discern, the actions we take, the times we speak up, the initiatives we undertake, the resources we budget, the deliberations we engage, the futures we dream, all shape those of our peers, our colleagues, our friends, our visitors, and our many interlocutors. We are, like to a democracy, simultaneously inhabitants and stewards of this college. As we live and work here, we shape the shared experiences and thus the future of this college and the society it shapes. This point becomes more vivid if we look to an aspect of the house on which Bachelard actually does not spend a great deal of time, the threshold. An architectural feature and moment in time appropriate to an inauguration as we step into this next chapter of the college's history together and instructive to a society and thus a college as articulated in Arundhati Roy's April 2020 essay, The Pandemic is a Portal. In its memorable words, she asks us what we will carry across the threshold between the pre-pandemic world and the post-pandemic world this deep threshold on which we all still stand. 
We can choose to walk through it, she writes, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us, or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. And so we can talk of and act on what we usher in together at the college and in society on the other side of a threshold on which we stand. Inspired, as many of you know, I have been for years by John Dewey and his claim that democracy must be reborn with each generation and that education is its midwife. I think of the threshold across which education ushers in democracy and of our stewardship of this dwelling place, this college, as it engages in that crucial and perpetual emergence. In speaking of the birth of a new world, in No Name in the Street from 1972, James Baldwin foretold, this birth will not be easy. And many of us are doomed to discover that we are exceedingly clumsy midwives. No matter, so long as we accept that our responsibility is to the newborn, acceptance of responsibility contains the key. Acceptance of responsibility is at the heart of stewardship. And I pledge to you that within this clumsiness, I bring a resolve to learn and try again so that we can stand again and again on thresholds and be ready to imagine the new worlds we can create together. Dearest Grinnellians, I stand before you today on the threshold of this future of a shared past with these three commitments to foster imagination, to maintain the multiplicity of experiences, and to steward our dwelling places. I pledge to do my utmost in our continued co-creation of this college to build and claim with you all that we hold in trust, the vitality of this college, of our mission, and of each other. On this inauguration day, in this moment that has gathered us to look to our future together, I affirm to you that it is the honor of my life and will be the dedication of my energies to serve and steward this institution in all that it makes possible and all that it can be. Join me and let us perpetually inaugurate Grinnell College in all we do. Thank you.